Good evening and welcome everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started because we only have two hours uh, with Dr. Walsh and as you saw from looking at this flyer, we could spend two hours talking about any one of the items that are bulleted in, in here because they're all so very important. Uh, again, thank you for being here. I know it's a, it's a Wednesday night and a long weekend and so I'm so glad to see everyone here in the audience. My name is Brenda Carrillo and I'm the Student Services Coordinator for the district and uh, my work is essentially to support the schools with social emotional um, resources and interventions to make sure that our students are really um, supported not only academically but as a whole child and so I'm very excited to be here with you tonight to present Dr. Uh, David Walsh and uh, you probably saw from up here, we're gonna be talking about something very important today, which is why do they act that way? And so you will walk away with the secret to why teens act that way. Only this group is gonna know the secret of how to, how to, how to make uh, things better. And I, I know how that is. I have an, uh, had an adolescent as well, and it's, it's often very challenging. And uh, especially challenging when we think about the addition of technology, which is relatively new uh, for, our, for our children. They're growing up in a very different time than the time that, that we grew up. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce uh, Dr. Walsh and I'm gonna spend a little bit of time introducing him because he is, he's a very distinguished speaker and I'm, I'm so glad that he was able to be here with us today. So I wanna give you a, a sense of, of who he is and then we'll, we'll welcome him up here. So Dr. Walsh is one of the world's leading author authorities on children, teens, parents, family life and the impact of technology on children's health and development. He spent 10 years teaching and coaching high school students, so he has real life experience. He founded the internationally renowned National Institute on Media and the Family in 1995. And in 2011, he founded Mind Positive Parenting to translate cutting edge brain science to everyday practice for parents, teachers, and other professionals. Dr. Walsh has presented workshops to parents, educators, and professionals throughout the world. He is a consultant to the World Health Organization and the ministry, ministries of education in Japan, South Korea, and Singapore, in, and he has testified before congressional committees. He's the author of several books and has authored columns on numerous topics, and his articles have appeared in newspapers across the country. He's also been a guest on the NBC Today Show, Good Morning America, the CBS Early Show, and Dateline, just to name a few. So please join me in welcoming Dr. David Walsh. Thank you. Thanks, Brenda. Thank you very much. Uh, can I be heard in the back okay? Good, good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for coming on a Wednesday night when you could be doing lots of other things. Thanks for inviting me. I am from Minneapolis, where it will be below zero tomorrow night. <laughs> it is very nice to be here in Palo Alto. So thank you for the invitation. A couple uh, logistical things uh, before we get going. Uh, one is that I did uh, put uh, about 10 copies of the book. So if, we're, if there are some topics that you're interested in that we don't get to tonight, I do have a limited number of copies of the book that you can take a look at afterward. Uh, if any of you want to consider what we do tonight, you might want to wait until we go for a while, but if any of you want to consider what we do tonight as the beginning of a conversation rather than a one-time event, just fill out one of these cards because we are forming an online community. Now we have about 15,000 parents and professionals around the world. What that means is that we send out updates to you, short things. It's free, it's voluntary. If you're not interested, don't bother. Um, but uh, kind of, you know, what's the latest research? What are some things that we think that uh, might be important for you? So feel free to fill out one of those cards. If we run out of the cards, a business card or just your name and your email address will, uh, will suffice. So I think that's uh, in the way of business. The other challenge is that the list of topics that we have tonight could keep us here till midnight with no problem at all. The problem is that if, we went, if I went until midnight, uh, I would be the only one in the room. The room would be dark and I'd still be here talking. So I'm gonna try to pack as much as I can into about the hour and 45 minutes that we, uh, that we have and hopefully we'll get through as, as, uh, as much as we can because it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's an important topic, this whole notion of teenagers. As was mentioned in the introduction, my interest uh, in adolescence comes from kind of two perspectives. One is that a lot of my career 
has been working with teenagers and their families. Uh, I went from the classroom into healthcare where I developed counseling programs for teens and uh, families. The other, of course, is my personal. Uh, my wife and I raised three teenagers who are all now adults and parents themselves. Uh, one of the reasons I write books is to get revenge on Dan, <laughs> Brian, and Aaron. Uh, you know, it's interesting, uh, because of my interest in, in adolescence, uh, I spent a lot of time writing and talking about adolescence many years ago until my own kids became adolescents, at which point I stopped because then I knew that I did not know what I was talking about. <laughs> but now that my kids are, are adults and parents themselves, I've started to do a lot more work around this uh, topic of, uh, of teenagers uh, and trying to answer the question, why do they act that way? How many of you are, how many of you work with teenagers? Okay, some of you. How many of you are parents of teenagers? Okay, that explains a lot. How many of you were teenagers at one time in your life yourselves? <laughs> so everybody has something that they can, they can relate with. Let me give you a roadmap of where we're going to go tonight. We're going to spend a very few minutes in the very beginning uh, talking about some very basic principles of brain development and brain functioning. We're going to go through it quickly and we're just going to hit a couple basics. And the, ones that, the reason I want to do that is because we'll connect some dots later on. And then, surprisingly, we will spend another couple of minutes talking about babies. Now, you might think to yourself, wait a second, we came here to, tonight to talk about adolescents. Why are we spending any time talking about babies? If you'll hang with me, I think you'll see why, because some of the things that we're going to be talking about later make sense when we kind of pay attention uh, to, to, you know, to, to babies, and hopefully that will make a little bit more sense. And then we'll get into teenagers themselves, and then a number of topics related to them. So there we go, that's kind of a road map. So uh, here's where we'll get going. If any of you want to do any of the social media things, those are the, the handles and the, you know, all, this, all of this new way of communicating, right? Um, and the, most of the information uh, that we're going to be talking about tonight is in the book, Why Do They Act That Way? But of course, there are many other topics that we won't have time to get into tonight. But we are going to start here, the basic building block of this miracle that we carry around on top of our shoulders, a brain cell or a neuron. This is the basic unit of a vast electrical system. And this very short video will give you an idea of how this electrical system works. The electrical system inside our head is not the same as the one in the wall. This is a chemical electrical system. And so you might remember from high school chemistry that certain molecules can carry a positive or a negative charge. They're called ions. And that's how the electrical charge passes down the cable, called an axon, of a brain cell, and then out the branches, called dendrites, where the branches meet the branches of neighboring neurons. But as you'll see here, when the, the, the branches of one neuron do not actually connect with the neighboring neuron. In between, there's a tiny little gap called a synapse, the Greek word for gap. And in that synapse, there is a stew of very, very important chemicals known as neurotransmitters. Why are they called that? Because as you see there in animation, they transmit the electrical charge across the gap. My nickname and the nickname that others use for those molecules, uh, for the neurotransmitters, molecules of emotion. Because it turns out that those chemicals have a tremendous impact on our feelings. And we'll be talking about a couple of those uh, as we go through this evening. Uh, the numbers are just astounding. When a baby enters the world, that baby arrives with about 100 billion neurons, each with about 10,000 branches, meaning the possible number of connecting points in a newborn baby's brain is about one quadrillion connections. But when a baby is born, only about 17% of those brain cells are wired together. And so then what follows in the days, the weeks, the months, the years, and as we'll talk about tonight, the decades that follow, those billions and billions of brain cells wire together. Now, the wiring is driven by two forces, okay? One is the heart, what I call the hard wiring, that's the genetics. We have literally encoded in our DNA instructions, instructions about which brain cells connect with which at what point in time. As I said, I refer to that as the hard wiring. That's involuntary. We have no control over that. Okay? But in addition to the hard wiring, we have 
the soft wiring. What's the soft wiring? The experiences that we have. The, you know, at some point, we might be able to tinker with that hard wiring. That's what all of the genetic research that happen, that's happening at universities like Stanford and other universities around the world. But at this point where we have the opportunity to influence the wiring is on the soft wiring side, on the experience side. And we should not underestimate how important that is. Neuroscientists themselves have coined a little phrase to underline the importance of experience, and that's the phrase, the neurons that fire together, wire together. The more they fire together, the stronger the connection becomes. Now, not long ago, I was talking about this basic principle with a group of third graders at a school in Indiana. And by the way, if you want to have fun, talk about brain science to third graders. They get it, and they're very interested in it. So I was talking to this group of third graders, and I asked them, I said, now, how many of you like sports? They all put up their hands. There was a little girl in the front row, so I looked at her and I said, well, what's your favorite sport? She said, tennis. I said, that's a great example. I said, now, do you remember what it was like when you first started playing tennis? She thought for a second, she smiled, she said, I could barely hold the racket and I couldn't hit the ball. I said, well, now you're in the third grade, how's your tennis game? She said, I'm starting to get pretty good. I said, how did you get from not being able to hit the ball to being pretty good? She said, well, I practiced. I said, that's right. And do you know that that makes you a brilliant neuroscientist? Because practice is the English word that translates the principle, the neurons that fire together, wire together. Whatever the brain does a lot of is what the brain gets good at. Whatever the brain does a lot of is what the brain gets good at. Whether it's tennis, whether it's math, whether it's texting, whether it's video games, whether it's perseverance, whether it's, we're going to be talking about later tonight, executive function, and we'll talk about what that means. Whatever the brain does a lot of is what the brain gets good at. Now, it's important for, here's what we're going to talk about babies, so hang with me for a second. Um, it's important to remember that um, what's, what, what some of the brain's primary mission, uh, what the brain's primary mission is. Of course, our brains enable us to do all sorts of amazing things, but the brain's primary job is to keep us alive. Okay? And when we remember that the brain's primary job is to help us survive, then some of the ways that the brain is built and some of the ways that the brain works okay, make a lot more sense. So if my brain's primary mission is to keep me alive, then one of the things that it better be good at is the ability to detect and react quickly to danger, okay? Because if my brain can help me re detect and react quickly to danger, then I'm much more likely to survive. Well, it turns out that our brains are exquisitely designed to do exactly that. And of course, as adults, we know it by the, 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 uh, the, the slang term, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, what do we call that? The, no, no, not the survival thing, but fight or flight, thank you. I just had a mind lapse there. The fight or flight. Okay, so it works like this. Imagine I'm driving down the freeway, and a car ahead of me has a blowout and starts to spin out of control. Would I need to fall over to the side of the road, turn off the engine, and say, okay, now what do I do? No. Within a fraction of a second, okay, my pulse rate would soar, my blood pressure would go up, the adrenaline would flow, I'd be gripping that steering wheel. In fact, do you know that I would actually be reacting before I even knew what I was reacting to? And so this fight or flight, this fight or flight circuits, these fight or flight circuits in the brain are so important that they are wired into our brains even before we're born. They are wired into the fetal brain. Fetal brain. Now, let's think about that for a second. We don't usually talk like this, but I think you would agree with me that the life of a fetus is a pretty darn good life. I mean, think about it. Okay, temperature controlled environment. Temperature never varies by a degree or two. How sweet is that? Sound attenuated environment. No sharp, shrill sounds. Everything kind of is, is nice and quiet and muffled. In fact, life as a fetus is so darn good, I don't even have to worry about eating. 
Mom takes care of it. In fact, life as a fetus is so sweet, I don't even have to worry about breathing. Mom even sees to that. And then comes a day of rude awakening. <laughs> it's called my birthday. The first thing that has to happen is that I have to get from in here to out there. And you expect me to fit through there? I think you would agree that the journey itself is rather stressful. And then even after I complete the journey, things get worse, OK? First of all, it's no longer 98.6 degrees in here. I don't know what the temperature is, but I'm chilly. Okay? I am hearing sounds that I've never heard before. And then there are these beings walking around. I find out years later they call them people. And one of these beings has the nerve to come along with a sharp needle, stick it in the bottom of my foot, and take my own blood out. I think you would agree this is pretty threatening and pretty stressful. So what do infants do? Cry. In fact, they don't cry. They scream. They scream bloody murder. And here's the reason. The reason that they scream bloody murder is because their repertoire of responses to deal with that stress or danger at that point in their life is very, very limited. Now, there are two important things about this. One is that it takes a long time for them to build out that repertoire of responses. Okay? Uh, because, you know, so I even in the days and weeks and months later, Things continue to be stressful, OK? Uh, their digestive systems aren't very developed. And so they get these gas bubbles, which hurt like crazy, OK? And so what do they do? They cry, because it takes so long for them to build out their repertoire. Now picture that baby two years later. Picture that baby, uh, you have Target stores here, right, in the Palo Alto area. Imagine that baby um, two years old in a Target store late in the afternoon. And that little baby is tired, hungry, and frustrated. Now, it wouldn't be pleasant, but I don't think it'd be terribly shocking for any of us to see a two-year-old lying in the aisle at Target, kicking and screaming. OK? Wouldn't be shocking. Now, imagine walking into a Target late in the afternoon and seeing a 25-year-old lying in the aisle, kicking and screaming. What would you do? You'd dial 911, right? <laughs> because by then, we would hope that their repertoire of responses to deal with stress or threat is a lot more developed. But it takes a long time to get there, OK? Fact number two, babies don't develop the ability to calm themselves on their own. We human beings are wired to be in relationships. And so babies outsource the ability to calm themselves to their caregivers to mom, dad, daycare providers. And now we are learning more and more how very, very important this relationship is. If you've studied developmental psychology or child psychology, you know that what we're talking about is what's now called the attachment relationship. And how critically important that is for the future development We're noticing that there's more people in, in this room than there are seats, and we've set up a live stream in room A. So if anybody would like to sit down and listen to Dr. Walsh's presentation down the hall and have a seat, you can follow Gigi. She's in the green shirt, and she'll walk you over to room A. Just wanted to let you know, because it's getting warm in here, and uh, there's a little bit more time. So please follow Gigi if you want a, a place to sit. Thank you. OK. So if any of you want to go, Give it live stream, feel free. They outsource it. And who do they outsource it to? To us. I've got seven grandchildren under the age of five. And so I spend a lot of time with babies these days. OK? So it was just a couple weeks ago that my uh, grandson, Graham, uh, who is four months old, uh, they were over for dinner. And he was screening up a storm. And uh, my son and daughter-in-law kind of looked at me and, you know, a little bit concerned. And, you know, and I said, oh, babies cry. That's what they do. Babies cry a lot. And then I said, Dan, why don't you let me hold Graham while you and Annie get some dinner? And Dan said, that, Dan's my son. He said, that'd be great. So let's think of what I did. So I took my grandson, four-month-old grandson, Graham, who's screaming, 
Now, did I stand there and hold them out like this? No, instinctively, what did I do? Okay? Held them close and wrapped my arms around them. And do you notice what you do? And no one has to teach us to do this. When we're holding a screaming baby, do we just stand there? No. What do we do? We rock back and forth. Rock back and forth. And no matter where in the world you go, no matter what language people speak, everybody says the same thing to a screaming baby. What do we say? Shh. <laughs> Why do we hold them close and wrap our arms around them? Why do we rock back and forth? Why do we say shh? because we're taking advantage of brain principle number one. The neurons that fire together, wire together. That baby has already wired in during fetal development those cues, okay? So the holding them close kind of reminds them what it was like when they were inside mom's tummy. And the rocking back and forth was what it was like when mom used to walk from room to room and the sound of shh mimic the sounds of fluids as they were coursing through mom's body. In other words, what we're doing is we're reminding the baby of what life was like when things were really good. <laughs> and then what we, so, see, and, and then what happens is because we give them that experience of calming that they eventually, and it takes years to do it, they eventually start to calm themselves. Now this relationship is critically important. It's called the attachment relationship, and it's defined by four characteristics. Present, attentive, attuned, and responsive. I need people around there, around me, who are paying attention, who are there, who are responding to my needs. Now, rather than talk about this more, I want to show you a short video, uh, because I think this is a uh, kind of a, a clear, it's, it's not too long, but it, it gives us a clear indication of how important this is. In this still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. And she gives a greeting to the baby, the baby gives a greeting back to her. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. Okay. Scientists can sometimes be very cruel in their search for knowledge. Let's think about what we just saw there. In the early part of that little experiment, there was this beautiful two-way communication going on between mom and her little girl. It wasn't one way, it was two way. The mom was responding to the little girl just as much as the little girl was responding to the mom. In fact, one of the, uh, one of the, the, the reasons that babies smile at such an early age, because as you know, many babies will smile three or four months old. And they think the reason babies smile at such an early age is to provide positive feedback for the caregiver. So they'll hang in there <laughs> because it is really hard work, okay? And then the connection was broken. Immediately, the baby picked up on it. And so what did the baby do? Well, that baby went through all of the strategies that she had in her repertoire to reestablish connection. She pointed. She held out her arms. She smiled. Nothing worked. And finally, when nothing worked, what happened? She fell apart emotionally. 
Now, you just saw a little baby fall apart emotionally in a matter of a minute or two. Imagine what it's like for a child who does not get that attachment, not for a minute or two, but hour after hour, day after day, year after year. See, that's the child who has literally been robbed of the experience of learning how to calm him or herself. So that's the seventh grader who gets very, very easily frustrated. That's the adult who gets cut off on the freeway. And instead of letting it pass, decides, I'm going to get that son of a gun. And then we're talking about road rage. See, one of the reasons that I know we're not here to talk about babies tonight, but see, we see clearly what happens when babies are under threat, when there's no connection. We never lose the need for connection. We just get better at covering it up. See, that's what happens. We just get better at covering it up. And so one of the things that we'll finish with tonight, in another hour and a half from now, is we'll talk about what do adolescents need. One of the three ingredients that adolescents need, I'll tell you what the three ingredients are, okay? They need guidance, connection, and love. And of course, connecting with an adolescent can sometimes get tricky because what are they doing? They're asking for a divorce. The request for divorce sounds like this. Get out of my life. Get off my back. Nobody else's parents are like you. <laughs> the mistake that we make is if we grant the divorce that our kids are asking for. One of the challenges in parenting adolescents is to find ways to stay connected even when it's very, very challenging because we never lose that need for connection. Tomorrow I'll be working with the professional staff here at the school district for an entire day, and we're gonna be, one of the things we're gonna be talking about is that whole importance between connection and learning. See, because when I feel in a state of threat, it's very difficult for me to learn. That's why, that's why kids who are bullied don't do well in school. The reason that kids who are bullied don't do well in school is that it's very, very difficult to activate the cortex where I think and problem solve when I'm under a state of threat because literally activity shifts from the cortex, my thinking brain, down into the more survival aspects. So, you know, if I'm in the ninth grade, now I'm walking down the hallway and some other kids look around and say, oh, no teachers, and they push me up against the the, uh, up against the lockers and they say, Walsh, we're going to get you after school today. And then I go into math class. Do you really expect me to be able to pay attention in math class? I'm in survival mode. Okay? And it's not just physical stuff. Imagine I'm a girl in that ninth grade class and I'm sitting in that math class, which happens to be the period before lunch. And I'm thinking to myself, I wonder whether anybody will eat lunch with me today. Or will they all get up and move like they did yesterday? Very, very difficult to, to, you know, to activate. So when we talk about connecting with kids, when I'm talking tomorrow with the professional staff about how important it is to connect with all of kids, it's not just something nice. It's literally critical to liberate, to empower the cortex to operate at peak efficiency. I'm going to skip a couple topics and maybe come back to them if we have time, but I want to get, I want to, um, I want to get into the teenage brain. You, you see me skipping some things because I'm paying attention to my watch and I want to make sure we get through a lot of the key things before we're done. And if we have time, we'll go back and pick up some of those other things. Um, many of you raised your hand, almost all of you raised your hand when I say many of you are the parents of teenagers. Do any of these descriptions kind of ring true. Our, your, our youth now love luxury. They have bad manners, contempt for authority. They show disrespect for their elders and love chatter in the place of exercise. They no longer rise when elders enter the room. They, con they, they contradict their parents, chatter before company, gobble up their food, and tyrannize teachers. Do any of those descriptions 
ring true? Those are the words of Socrates. who described adolescence that way 2,500 years ago. So one of the things that we need to remember is that the behaviors that we're going to start to talk about now that are sometimes puzzling, sometimes a little bit scary, sometimes maddening, are not new. They've been going on for thousands of years. What is new is the explanation. And it, because it turns out that we have been making, we, meaning collectively, human beings, had been making a big mistake about adolescence. The mistake that we'd been making is that we thought that their brain was finished all its physical development by about the age of 12. See, we've been talking about little babies for a little while. Well, a little baby is born with a brain that, on average, about three quarters of a pound. It triples in size in one year. So none of us have any trouble imagining all of the growth that's going on inside those little noggins. Well, that growth continues, not as fast as that first year, but that growth continues until about the age of 12, when a boy or a girl's brain reaches its adult size. And so we thought that that meant all the physical development was done. Turns out that's not true. And here's the evidence of the mistake. These are brain scans of brains at different ages. The different colors reflect different levels of physical development. So over on the far left, you have a brain scan of a five-year-old. Over on the far right, the brain scan of a 20-year-old. Well, they look almost completely different. Okay. Well, that's not a big surprise, because we wouldn't have expected the brain development of a five-year-old to be the equivalent of the brain development of a 20-year-old. But there are surprises. The, in the middle top is the brain scan of a 12-year-old. Compare that to the 20-year-old. Very, very different. Compare the 12 to the 16. Different. 16 to 20. Still differences. They weren't supposed to look that way. We thought, up until quite recently actually, in the last decade, about a decade ago, we thought that the brain was finished all its physical development by about the age of 12. Where if that were true, then those three, the 12, 16, and 20, would all look pretty much the same. And as you can see with your own eyes, they don't. Now this is, of course, the 20,000 foot level. So what we're going to do now is drop down to ground level and do a quick tour of some of the major, what I call, construction zones going on inside the teenage brain. Now our first stop on the tour is going to be a part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. It's right here. If you take the first two fingers of your hand and you put them just above your eyebrows, you are about half an inch away from th this part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. Turns out to be a very important part of the brain. All, of course, all the parts are. But this is a particularly important part, and I think you'll understand why in just a couple of minutes. Now, we learned one of our important lessons, first and important lessons about this part of our brain from a very uh, kind of uh, unusual person. Uh, if you've studied brain science, you might be familiar with the fellow up on the screen. His name is Phineas Gage. Now, it's very kind of surprising that all brain students learn about Phineas Gage because he wasn't a scientist. He didn't write any books. He didn't do any breakthrough experiments. He was a railroad worker. He worked for the Burlington and Rutland Railroad in rural Vermont in the middle of the 19th century. Phineas Gage was a great guy. Okay? He was loyal, hardworking, honest, dependable, respectful. Because of all of those traits, he was promoted very quickly in his career. And by the age of 25, he was named foreman of a crew. On September 18, 1848, Phineas Gage's crew was given the job of blasting rock with dynamite so that other crews could come through later and lay new track. So Phineas, as the foreman, made the assignments. To one person, he gave the job of getting the, the, uh, the, the dynamite from the cart, putting it into place. The next job was to tamper. He took that job himself. Another job was the person who would set the fuse. So mid-morning, uh, some dynamite was taken from the cart and put into place. Phineas Gage's tamping instrument was a steel rod. 
It weighed 13 pounds. It was five and a half feet long. He went to tamp the dynamite. Unfortunately, the tip of the steel rod struck a rock, creating a spark, detonating the dynamite. Converting that five and a half foot steel rod into an instant missile headed straight for Phineas Gage's head, he had no chance to move. It entered his head right beneath his left cheek, came out the top of his head, and landed 30 feet behind him. When that rod landed, not only was Phineas Gage still alive, he was still conscious. And by the way, this story is true. I am Irish, but this is true. Okay? <laughs> His co-workers were horrified. This was a terrible accident. They quickly loaded Phineas into a cart and they raced to town looking for medical help. <laughs> Lucky for them, the doctor that they found was this, whoops, excuse me, was the fellow on the right, Dr. John Martin Harlow. A brilliant young physician who saved Phineas Gage's life and actually nursed him to a recovery to the point where, he's a, he, where he was able to return to his job three months later. So he went back to his job as foreman of the Burlington and Rutland Railroad and within two weeks got fired. Why? Not because he couldn't do the job, but because in the words of Phineas's friends, Gage was no longer Gage. In place of the honest dependable Gage, there was a dishonest schemer. In place of the respectful friendly Gage, there was a mean, vulgar, cursing Gage. He was never able to hold another steady job for the rest of his life, bounced from place to place, ended up dying years later near here in San Francisco. Now, when Phineas Gage died, that young town doctor was no longer in that little town. He was brilliant. He was on the faculty at Harvard. And he, he heard about Phineas's death, and he decided to check with the family to see if there was any way he could examine the body. The family agreed. So Phineas Gage's body was transported across the country. In fact, the skull of Phineas Gage, which you see on the left, is still on display at this very moment at the Medical Museum at Harvard because it was in that post-mortem examination that we learned our first lessons about the prefrontal cortex. We now know that the prefrontal cortex is known as the executive center of the brain. It's the brain's CEO. It's the part of the brain that helps us to plan, consider consequences, assess risk. It's also the part of our brain that helps us manage emotional impulses and urges. Now, I don't know about you, but I sometimes need help with my impulses and urges. I mean, just between the two of us, please don't repeat this outside of here, but I sometimes have thoughts that are not very nice. I sometimes have impulses that are not very good. Well, now what I know is the part of my brain that helps me manage those impulses and urges is the prefrontal cortex. When the prefrontal cortex is not up to the task, what happens? We get impulsive behavior, risky behavior, disorganized thinking, negative conflict seeking. Calvin sums it up nicely. In this particular cartoon sequence, Calvin had been sent to the corner by his mother for his latest crime. He's, of course, talking things over with Hobbes. And his conclusion is, Hobbes, my problem is my lips move when I think. That's a prefrontal cortex that's not working very well. Now, why are we talking about the prefrontal cortex? Because all of you who raised your hand when I asked if you were parents of adolescents, what's important to realize is that the prefrontal cortex undergoes major construction as a boy or girl enters puberty. The rewiring continues throughout the teenage years and is not completed until the mid-twenties. Now, does this start to make some sense or what? I still remember the conversation that took place in my home when my son Brian, our middle one, was about 15 years old. We're sitting at dinner one night, and Brian looks across the table at me and Monica. Monica's my wife. And he announces, I no longer need a curfew. <laughs> I looked at him, and I said, oh, really? And why is that? Why I ask such a stupid question? I have no idea. <laughs> because he had his case fully prepared. And by the way, you will not be surprised when I tell you that today Brian is an attorney. <laughs> he is. 
So he laid out his case. I'm a good kid. I don't get in any trouble. I get good grades. And don't you think it's about time you and mom quit treating me like a kid? Now, the best I could come up with that night was because I said so. <laughs> Today, my answer would be a little bit different. Today, my answer would sound something like this. Brian, you may think you're fully mature, but based on the latest brain research, there are some very important circuits that have to get wired. And until that's done, you've got a curfew. Because in this sense, what's a curfew? It's a surrogate prefrontal cortex. And that becomes the role of parent, teacher, counselor, coach, is to literally serve as the surrogate prefrontal cortex while that young one is getting wired. You know what industry knows this very, very well? The automobile insurance industry. I mean, think about it. Why would a, an 18 or a 19 year old's car insurance be double or triple mine? You'd think they'd be lower. They probably have better eyesight, quicker reactions. With all the video games they're playing, their high and eye coordination is better than mine. Okay? Well, State Farm doesn't need to know the brain science, they just look at the statistics. They know that adolescent drivers seek thrills don't think necessarily of the consequences, don't assist the risk very well, and as a result, they get in a lot more accidents, so they charge them more. Now, as important as the prefrontal cortex is to understand that that's a construction zone, um, it, things get really interesting when we see how do we connect the dots between that construction zone and some others. So we will continue our tour. Before we do, young man, say the parents, go to your room and stay there until your cerebral cortex matures. <laughs> the next stop on our tour will be the Acceleration Center. Now, the Acceleration Center is not the official term. I make up nicknames. Um, prefrontal cortex is official. You'll see that in textbooks. But Acceleration Center is the kind of term you only find in my book, so I can kind of keep it straight. What do I mean by Acceleration Center? What I mean by Acceleration Center, it's a process. It's a process that involves chemicals. So far, all, all we've talked about are billions and billions of brain cells. Well, in addition to all of those brain cells, we have two very, very important groups of chemicals in our brain. One group we've already mentioned, neurotransmitters, and here's the other group, and I'm sure you've heard of them, hormones. First of all, what is a hormone? Let's make sure we know what a hormone is. A hormone is a chemical messenger. That's what hormones are, that's what they do which is why I call them Paul Revere's. Because what they do is they race around the body bringing messages from one organ to another. Our body produces more than 50 of them in 12 different glands that are located throughout the body. Three of them take center stage as a boy or girl enters adolescence. They're known as the growth hormones. Testosterone, the growth hormone for the boys, and the girls have two estrogen and progesterone, okay? Now, there's a part of the brain, back to the brain again, there's a part of the brain that is the master control for the hormone system. It's called the hypothalamus, okay? It's the master control for the hormone system. Uh, by the way, the other fancy name for hormone system is endocrine system. Hormone, endocrine, same thing. But the hypothalamus is master control, so you probably won't be surprised when I tell you that's where the event that we call puberty begins. The first thing that happens is the hypothalamus dispatches a Paul Revere down to one of the, down to one of the glands, the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland happens to be in the brain itself. The message that arrives is start the growth spurt. The pituitary gland gets the message and in turn dispatches legions of Paul Revere's racing throughout the body, stimulating all of those changes that we summarize with the word puberty. One of the changes is the dramatic increase in the growth hormones. Now, let's start with the boys because it's a simpler story. There's one, testosterone. Testosterone production ramps up. And when I say ramps up, I am not kidding. Concentrations of testosterone increase by 1,000% from the beginning of adolescence to the end. 
And on many days, there are as many as seven surges of testosterone every day. Now, another new discovery, more recent discovery, is that we now know that there's another part of the brain that turns out to be very rich in testosterone receptors. This little part of the brain has a funny name, unless you speak Greek. It's called the amygdala, which is the Greek word for almond, the nut, because it looks like one. It's the size and the shape of an almond. But what you need to know is that the amygdala is the anger center of the brain. As the testosterone starts to flow, it starts to flood into the amygdala, which starts to light up like the 4th of July. So what does that look like in real life? Well, that's the easygoing, happy-go-lucky 10-year-old who can turn into a sullen, withdrawn, chip-on-the-shoulder, fire-breathing dragon at the age of 14. And it's what's going on in his brain. Sometimes it's as confusing to him on the inside as it is to everybody else on the outside. Because now he can experience these surges of anger, which can sometimes come out of nowhere, triggered by something as simple as, would you please take out the garbage? So now, this boy is experiencing these surges of anger, but didn't we just get finished saying that our brain comes fully equipped with circuits to manage emotional impulses and urges? And of course, those circuits are in the prefrontal cortex, but what did we say about it? Under construction. I think you would agree that this is not particularly good timing. At the very time that the boy could use extra help managing emotional impulses and urges, the emotional regulation center of the brain is out to lunch. Which is why teenage boys may at times be risk takers, thrill seekers, quick to anger. It's why we sometimes scratch our heads and say, how could such a smart kid do such a stupid thing? The answer to that question is, has nothing to do with smart. The thinking part of his brain is absolutely fine. It's the emotional regulation center of the brain that's under construction. I was talking about this at a, uh, at a, at a workshop in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, not too long ago. Uh, this, was an this was a day-long workshop. We're kind of doing the, a little abbreviated version this evening. But this was a day-long, and during one of the breaks, a teacher, young teacher came up to me and said, Dr. Walsh, she said, I'm so glad that you explained this teenage anger thing. She says, it finally helps to make some set, sense out of something that's really bothered me for a long time. Then he told me what he was talking about. He shared with me then, he was, when he was about 15 years old, things were getting a little bit rocky between him and his parents. And his parents were getting worried. His mother one night saw an opportunity to have the conversation that she'd been waiting for. So he had gotten into bed but wasn't yet asleep, so she went in to say goodnight to him. She sat down beside him on the bed. She said, I've been looking for a chance to talk to you because I don't know what's going on anymore. We used to enjoy doing things together as a family. Now you never want to go anywhere with us. Everything I say seems to be the wrong thing. You're often in a bad mood. What's the matter? She looked her right in the eye and he looked her right in the eye and said, Mom, I just don't like you. <laughs> His mother's eyes filled with tears. She left the room crying. That conversation has bothered that young man ever since. As he told me at that workshop that day, he said, I could never figure out why I was so mean to my mother when I was a teenager. He said, now I get it. It was what was going on in my brain. Then he told me something neat. He said, you know, Dr. Walsh, she said, I'm going to go home and call my mother tonight and explain what I'd learned. Then he stopped. What he said next was even neater. He said, you know, I'm not just going to explain what I learned. I'm also going to apologize to her for something that I said that was really mean years ago. See, because all of you who raised your hands, you know that while teenagers can display a lot of this behavior to many adults, they like to reserve the vintage collection for their parents. <laughs> and when you're a parent, it can be really hard not to take it personally. It can be really hard 
to not take it personally when the, the voice at the other side of the slam door says, what a jerk. And that can be some of the nice stuff. <laughs> now, so far we've only talked about the boys, so we of course have to pick up the story with the girls, which while it has definite similarities, also has important differences. Starts off the same, of course. The hypothalamus dispatches a Paul Revere down to the pituitary gland with the message, start the growth spurt. Pituitary gland then dispatches the legions of Paul Revere's racing throughout the body with the message, start the growth spurt, start the growth spurt. And then there's a difference from the boys because she's got the girl, the, the young adolescent girl has two growth hormones, estrogen and progesterone. And as they increase in production, they also enter into a dance. As the level of one goes up, the other goes down, the second goes down, the first goes up. A, an ebb and flow pattern that I'm sure, as you know, repeats itself on average every 28 days, the menstrual cycle. Now that's not what the new information is. We've known about that for a long time. The new information is that we now have a much better idea of how the ebb and flow of estrogen and progesterone affect another chemical in the brain, but it's not a hormone, it's one of those molecules of emotion. And the one that is particularly susceptible to the ups and downs of estrogen and progesterone is serotonin. My nickname for serotonin is the mood stabilizer. When serotonin levels are in particular range, our mood is stable. When serotonin levels start to jump around, our mood can change. So now, back to the young adolescent girl experiencing for the first times in her life the ebb and flow of estrogen and progesterone. As that ebb and flow takes place, it has a big impact on serotonin levels which start to dip and rise. And when that happens, her mood can change on a dime. So what does that look like in real life? That's the young adolescent girl who can be as happy as a lark at 9 a.m., in the pits at 9.30, euphoric at 10, and homicidal by lunch. <laughs> and when the serotonin levels drop, something else happens. Emotional reactions get amplified. So this is what happened one morning in my home when my daughter Erin, the youngest of our three, was about 14 years old. She came down one morning before heading off to school. She decided to have cereal for breakfast. She got out the bowl, the spoon, the cereal, poured herself a bowl of cereal, then walked over to the refrigerator to get out the milk. When she opened up the refrigerator door, she discovered there was no milk, at which point she collapsed on the floor, <laughs> sobbing, I hate my life. Monica and I raced into the kitchen to see what terrible thing had happened. Aaron was able to make it clear, we're out of milk. <laughs> now, I think any of us would be frustrated without milk for our cereal, but I think you'd agree that I hate my life is a little bit of an implication. <laughs> I have to tell you something. I was, I was talking about this at a workshop about a year ago, and a woman came up to me during the break, and she said, whoops, she handed me her, um, she handed me her phone. She said, read this, okay? Her teenage daughter had texted her during the session. I read, I can't find my black pants. I hate my life. <laughs> Perfect timing. So now, this young adolescent girl is experiencing these intense emotions, quickly changing up and down, but her brain is also equipped with a prefrontal cortex, but just like her brother's, hers is also under construction. So even though there are these differences, of course, there's a lot of similarities. So if we were to just kind of summarize what we're talking about now, and if we were to compare an adolescent's brain to an automobile, it's as if the gas pedal's to the floor and the brakes are on back order, <laughs> which is why adolescents can be impulsive, risk takers, dramatic. And by the way, it's also the explanation for all of the things about adolescence that we love. The passion, the loyalty, the enthusiasm, it's all part of the same picture. Two dads walking down the street, I have four teenagers. I don't even need to leave home to get mugged. <laughs> Let's talk about communication. 
because, of course, as far back as the days of Socrates, and I'm sure even before then, communication between adults and adolescents has been challenging. Now, when I was in graduate school many years ago, I was taught that all of the communication problems between adults, particularly parents and kids, are, are the result of you know, uh, psychological factors. Struggle for independence, search for identity, all of those things. And I think they're all true. However, it turns out that the real explanation for the challenges in communicating between, uh, communication between a, a adults and adolescents is once again what's going on in the brain. Here's the deal. As you, I'm sure, know, one of the things that's very, very important in good communication is the accurate interpretation of nonverbal cues, okay? So that when we're talking with one another, we're not just interpreting the words. We're interpreting all sorts of other things, nonverbals, facial expressions, tone of voice, gestures. And as you know, those, those are actually more important than the words. So if I come home at night and I come in the back door and I say to my wife, Monica, how was your day? She could say, fine, or she could say, fine. Same word, opposite meaning. And I better pick it up. Okay, now, okay, the latest brain research shows that when we adults are interpreting nonverbal cues, we use the trusty old prefrontal cortex, which I think you'd agree is a pretty good place to do it. Reflection, judgment. Okay, now the research shows that when adolescents are interpreting nonverbal cues, they don't do it there. Now, based on what you know so far about the brain, if there was one part that you would not want them to do it, where would that be? The amygdala, the anger center of the brain. Guess what? That's where they do it. The latest sh research shows that when adolescents are interpreting nonverbal cues, the amygdala activates, which leads them to sometimes misinterpret nonverbal cues. However, their mistakes are not random, their mistakes consistently go in the direction of anger and aggression. Now, as a dad, this makes perfect sense to me. Because I can remember these conversations, which I could never figure out. I'd be talking to Dan when he was a teenager, and he'd stop me and say, Dad, why are you yelling at me? Which I could never figure out. Because I didn't think I was yelling. And you know, sometimes I'd even have good witnesses. I thought Monica was a great witness. You know, so Dan would go storming off, and I'd say to Monica, Dan says I was yelling at him. Was I yelling? She'd say, I didn't hear you yell. I'd say, well, maybe I looked angry and hostile. Maybe that was it. She said, I thought you looked fine. <laughs> so you know what I thought? I thought he was trying to get out of stuff, okay, change the topic, be defensive. Turns out he was using a different part of his brain. The implications of what we're talking about right this moment play out in the hallways of that high school next to us every single day of the week. Imagine two adults walking down the, you know, walking down the hallway at Palo Alto High School. Can, can I ask your name? Uh, Ruby. Ruby. Imagine Ruby and I are walking down the hallway at Palo Alto High School and we bump into each other. We are likely to interpret that as, oh, maybe I wasn't paying attention, maybe I was walking too close. Now picture two 15-year-old boys walking down the ha hallway and they bump into each other. You know how that could get interpreted? He's dissing me. He's looking for a fight, and I'm going to give it to him. <laughs> now connect the dots and watch how quickly this can escalate. So it starts off with miscommunication. How's the anger center of that brain? Could be in high gear. How about the prefrontal cortex? Out to lunch. It can escalate sometimes quickly, sometimes tragically give you an example of a tragic es escalation. I did a workshop for the school superintendents in Tennessee a couple of years back. And right after the workshop, Carol Johnson, who was then superintendent in Memphis, contacted me. She said, we have to have this workshop for our high school teachers. And then she told me why it was so important, why it was urgent in her judgment. Because at the end of that school year, shortly before school ended, there had been a murder in one of the Memphis high schools. And this is what happened. Two 15-year-old boys got into a disagreement in the hallway. They took it into the bathroom to settle it. A Couple minutes later, one of them walked out. The other was left behind unconscious on the floor. 
never, never regained consciousness and died several days later. The police investigation showed it all started with miscommunication. That isn't the word that they used. They used perceived insult. Now, those are the horror stories that we hope never come close to home. But all of us who have ever parented adolescents know that this escalation can take much less dramatic forms every day of the week. You know, so I say to my 14-year-old daughter, would you please help with the dishes? What I'm hoping to hear is, yes, Dad. <laughs> what I might hear is, why do I have to do it? Okay, well, if I'm not paying attention, that can push my button. And you know when my button gets pushed, you know where my little brain goes? You want to see anger, kid? I'll show you anger. Okay? And then I start to escalate. Escalating with an adolescent is always a bad idea. Always. Why? Because their brains are built for it. <laughs> Number two, if I escalate as the parent, then I run the risk of making big mistakes. The stakes that take the form of name calling, put downs, threats, because what do they do? They eat away at the connection. Remember we talked 45 minutes ago, how important that connection is. One of the ways that I look at kind of raising kids is that when my kids are young, I want to build up a bank account. I want that bank account to be filled as much as I can get it with goodwill, affection, okay? Because come the teenage years, there are likely to be some withdrawals from the account. Now, if there's a good account, we'll survive the withdrawals. If there's not much in the account, then it can get pretty tricky. Now, that doesn't mean that we, that doesn't mean we become doormats. In fact, quite the opposite. It's how we do it. Are there some ways that we can kind of reduce that miscommunication? Yes, there are. You know, will they always work? No, nothing, nothing's 100% guaranteed. But there are some things that might reduce. So, for example, rather than saying to an adolescent, you're really rude, it's actually going to be much more effective to say, I'm angry that you walked away while I was trying to talk to you. Because as soon as I start the sentence with you, point my finger and raise my voice, I can almost guarantee an argument. And you all know how long an, av an adolescent can, can argue about the definition of rude. Okay, But when I'm focused on the behavior, it's less likely to lead to that escalation. Uh, another practical tip, uh, avoid generalization. General, or generalizations are the words like always, never. Because as soon as I say to my daughter, you never help out around the house. Where's her brain gone? Searching for the exceptions to argue about, right? Oh, I never help out around the house, huh? Who do you think did the vacuum yesterday? Elmer Fudd? She's <laughs> often running to the races, and if I'm not careful, what do I do? Escalate with her. And that's when I run the risk of making those big mistakes. Another, another practical tip, stick to one issue. Sometimes when we finally have our teenagers' attention, we want to clean out the closet. <laughs> you know, when we start to bring up a laundry list of things that, that had kind of been bugging us. And pretty soon, it's a three-ring circus because we don't know what we're even talking about anymore. So sticking to one issue and, you know, and picking, picking and choosing our battles. We don't want to make a battle over everything with teenagers. We want to pick and choose. It doesn't mean we become doormats. It doesn't mean we become, you know, we, we put up with disrespectful behavior. But of course, in terms of disrespectful behavior, because many parents will, many parents have asked me, you know, well, what happens if my, you know, if my, uh, if my son or daughter starts to call me names, starts to swear and curse and swear at me? You say, well, first of all, it's very important that we model what we want. So that I need to be able to say, I don't treat you that way, and I will not put up with you calling me names. And then sometimes we need to interrupt the conversation and say, you know, we need to take a time out. 
You need to take a time out. Because right now it's escalating. You're getting upset. I'm getting upset. We need to take a time out. And we need to discuss this. We're not going to let it go. You let me know when you're ready to discuss this without calling me names or cursing and swearing. And it's surprising how quickly they can get themselves under control when they have to. And so that communication thing is something that makes, you know, makes a, a little bit more sense when they understand what's going on in the brain. Alcohol and drug use during adolescence. Um, it's pretty clear, I hope it's pretty clear in our discussion this evening, is that the adolescent brain is not the same as an adult brain. So if it's not the same as an adult brain, does that mean that things affect it differently? The answer to that is yes, because it's a brain that's growing. And that is very true when it comes to alcohol and drugs. Okay? Now, before we get into some of the differences, let's go back as we've been doing this evening and do a little quick, very quick little bit of the brain science. Um, the only neurotransmitter, I think, remember the nickname for neurotransmitters, molecules of emotion. I think the only one we've really talked about so far is serotonin. Well, there's another one that's very, very important, and that is dopamine. Okay? My nickname for dopamine is happy. When the dopamine is flowing, we feel good. When the dopamine is really flowing, we feel really good. Well, one of the things that alcohol and all of the street drugs, what they all have in common, is they all elevate dopamine, which of course makes sense. That's why they're attractive. I have never met anyone addicted to Pepto-Bismol. It does nothing for dopamine. But alcohol, pot, and all of the street drugs do. They all elevate dopamine. So with that in mind, let's talk about some of the differences. Difference number one, the adolescent brain is more easily addicted than the adult brain. Okay? Let me give you an example with nicotine. So, cigar uh, tobacco. Uh, nicotine is a very effective dopaminergic agent. That's a fancy way that scientists have of saying it's good at elevating dopamine. Okay? So once, see, the reason I might start to use tobacco could be any number of reasons. Maybe my friends are doing it, so there's peer pressure. Maybe I'm curious, and so I want to know what it's like. Okay? Maybe I think it makes me look cool. The reason I start, however, the reason I continue, I should say, is probably going to be very different from the reason I start. Because what starts to happen is this. Once I get the nicotine into my bloodstream, it's very, very good at elevating dopamine. What I don't know is happening because I can't feel it. My brain starts to create additional nicotine receptors on my brain cells. Okay? So now I've got more receptors for the nicotine. When they're all filled, how's my dopamine level? Nice and high, it makes me feel good. But now I've got more receptors to keep plugged with nicotine molecules. When they're not plugged, what happens? My dopamine level plummets. How do I feel? Crummy. The only way to feel good again is to plug those receptors with nicotine. Believe it or not, that process can actually happen with an adolescent in one experience. Not for all kids, but there is some research showing that for, for some kids, it, all it takes is one episode. Now let's kind of connect the dots. Imagine me talking to a group of high school kids and me telling them that. Okay? Their reaction is going to be, first of all, we don't know whether we can believe Walsh. I think he's making this stuff up. Okay? But then even if I do believe it, what is their brain likely to say? Not me. Because their risk assessment is not what it eventually will be. See, that's why the tobacco companies, all of those years, targeted kids. They knew they had to get them. The tobacco companies knew that if someone got to be 18 years old and they hadn't smoked, they probably never would. They knew they had to get them before they were 18. That's why they targeted kids all those years. And that's why still in other countries where there aren't laws protecting kids, they're still targeting kids. My son Dan spent a year, his junior year in Kenya, 
uh, in a remote village out near Lake Victoria. And when he came back, among the things that he shared with us, he said, you wouldn't believe it. He said, the, cigarette, the uh, tobacco representatives, the tobacco salespeople would come into the village handing out free cigarettes. Who would they give the free cigarettes to? To the kids. Because they knew once they had them hooked, then they had a customer for life, even if that life was going to be shorter. You know? And so the adolescent brain is more easily addictive. Difference number two, on a dose per dose basis, the damage can be greater. Okay? The damage can be greater. So, for example, if I switch to alcohol, one of the parts of the brain that is very, very susceptible to alcohol is a part of the brain, I haven't mentioned it yet, so I'll mention it now, called the hippocampus. The hippocampus, by the way, just a, a very quick aside, if you're wondering why all of these weird names for parts of the brain, when the parts of the brain were named, they were not named for what they do because we didn't know what they did. So what are they named for? What they look like. So they all carry Greek and Latin names for what they look like. Hippo, hippocampus is the Latin word for seahorse. Okay, amygdala, almond, Greek, hippocampus, Latin for seahorse, because it, it has kind of the shape of a seahorse. Cortex, it's the Latin word for bark, like the bark of a tree. Because if you think of the outside of the brain, it has kind of a bark-like appearance. The hippocampus is the memory registration center of the brain. Memories are stored all over the brain. But and memories all enter through a common registration center called the hippocampus. Okay? Um, if, when alcohol levels get high enough, the hippocampus shuts down. That's what a blackout is. See, if I go to a party and I drink too much, I'm going to have to ask you tomorrow what, I, what happened at the party, because I don't remember. I remember going, but once the alcohol level got high enough, the hippocampus stopped registering new memories. That's what a blackout is. If an adolescent hippocampus is bathed in alcohol frequently enough, there can be permanent damage. Now, that doesn't mean it gets destroyed, but it can be me there can be measurable damage. Is that a big deal? Yes, because the hippocampus is key to learning. If I can't register new memories, or if I have an impaired ability to register new memories, that is going to affect my ability to learn. The third difference is that warning signals are delayed. Okay, we don't know why, but for some reason the signals that tell me that my brain is being affected happen later in the episode for an adolescent. So if I start to drink, you know, at some point I'll get that funny feeling that we sometimes call a buzz. I'll start to slur my words. Those are all signals that my brain is being affected and I better stop. Okay, those signals don't go off in the adolescent brain until later. In fact, you will hear teenagers brag about this. You will hear teenagers say, I can hold my liquor. Okay? What they, I hope that's, is that me or you? Okay. okay. It might be me too. I realize I didn't turn mine off either. I'm going to do that right now in case one of my kids calls me. Because I'm the, I'm the oldest one in the room. They never stop calling. Um. What was I talking about? Warning, warning signals. Warning signals. You know, be, because they go off later. What do they do? They keep drinking, or they keep using. You see it on college campuses every fall term, when eighteen year, seven, eighteen year olds arrive on campus, and for many of them, it's the first time of their life when they're not really accountable to anybody. There's no curfew. Nobody's checking. Okay. And every campus that I know of is awash in alcohol. And so college administrators hold their breath every fall term because, you know, there are alcohol accidents on many ca campuses. And it's because the warning signals don't go off. Um, I just, I, th I think I'm going to add, before we get to this, I'm going to add another topic um, while we're talking about uh, adolescence. And that's 
that's the difference between boys and girls in terms of the sexual awakening. So I haven't, I haven't got slides for this because I just decided right now we should probably add this. Uh, because I be, I, I've been thinking about this because uh, we've been talking about some differences between boys and girls. And so here's another, here's another difference. Uh, one of the things that happens at puberty is the sexual awakening. Now, what happens in the boy's brain is that there's a part of the hypothalamus that has a very long, complicated name, the fourth interstitial nucleus of the anterior hypothalamus. Nobody ever says that. They always use the acronym, the INAH3. It gets bigger in the boy's brain, not the girl's. It gets bigger in the boy's brain at puberty. Okay? Now, that's important to know because that really drives a lot of the physical, of the interest in the physical dimensions of sex. So the INAH3 gets bigger along with seven surges of testosterone every day. So what does that mean? That means that occasionally teenage boys think about sex. <laughs> occasionally 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Does not mean that they're weird, it does not mean that they're sinners, it's what's going on in their brain. Okay. Uh, now, what happens in the girl's brain is a little bit different. The INAH3 does not get bigger in her brain. Now, now, does that mean she's not interested in sex? No, it doesn't mean that. But it means that it's driven in another way. There are two hormones, there are two hormones that increase in her brain at puberty related to the sexual awakening. One is, here's the surprise perhaps, if you don't know, testosterone. Not, as, not nearly as much as in the boy's brain, but it increases in the girl's brain too, and that drives some of her interest in the physical parts of sex. But that's accompanied by another hormone that increases in her brain and not his, and that is oxytocin. Now, many of you women, when you hear the word oxytocin, you may think of childbirth because it plays very, very important roles in childbirth. One of the roles it plays in childbirth gives it a nickname. It's often known as the bonding hormone because elevations in oxytocin often, dry, often are responsible for a young mom or a new mom literally falling in love with this little infant. That's the oxytocin. Now that increases in the young adolescent girl's brain at puberty, not because of childbirth, but because of puberty. So I've given it another nickname. I call it the cuddle <laughs> hormone. It's what prompts her to want to be physically close. Okay? That is the explanation for why adolescent girls will go to the bathroom in groups, arm in arm. You do not see guys doing that. <laughs> That's the oxytocin. Girls literally, they're not just comfortable with physical touch, but they, they like it. Okay? So that prompts her, let's say a girl is attracted to a boy. Well, that prompts her to want to be physically close, to hold hands, to hug, to cuddle. That may not be what's going on in his brain. <laughs> How might his brain interpret that? Oh, she's interested in sex. And then he might respond with a sexual advance. And how is her brain likely to interpret that? Oh, he really likes me. See, there are two parts of this, physical and relational. For the boys, capital P physical, small r relational. For girls, just the reverse. They're both there, but what's going on in the brain emphasizes different, different aspects of it. Now, these kinds of conversations are very important. While they might be a little bit difficult, very, very important for us to be having, having with our teenagers. And this is where we, I don't know about you individually, but collectively we are falling down on the job. Uh, there was a study that came out a couple of years ago Adolescents in anonymous surveys, only 18% of adolescents reported that they had good communication about sex with a trusted adult, 18%. Now, does that mean the other 82% aren't thinking about it? Of course not. Sometimes they're thinking about it a lot. But if we're not talking to them, then where are they getting their information? From their peers and from the media. And I don't think any of us really want you know, um, 
the media to be our, the sex, educa sex educators for our kids. And so it's something that we really need to kind of, uh, that we really need to kind of, kind of step up and do a better job. Because we have, you know, even though the teen pregnancy rates are going down, so there's good news. The, the good news, and you may have heard it, the teen pregnancy rates are definitely going down. And that's the result of a lot of the prevention work that's going on. However, sexually transmitted disease rates are not going down. And we have among the highest rates in the, uh, uh, in the world, in the industrialized world. We have many, many adolescents engaged in risky behavior, sexual risky behavior, and they don't even know it because nobody's telling them. And so it's something that we really need to step up and, and do, a bit, uh, do a better job. And, and by the way, um, as uh, before we leave this topic completely, uh, interestingly, some of the research on, uh, on gay and lesbian kids, there are brain differences. Now, I think pretty much we've gotten beyond the argument, you know, is this a choice or is it something that's hardwired? For example, the INAH3 in gay boys does not get bigger at puberty. It's literally an anatomical difference. Yeah. So this whole notion of, you know, um, you know, that something that kids are choosing is just it's, you know, sexual orientation is something that seems to be pretty hardwired and is probably determined at about the fourth or fifth week of fetal development when testosterone enters the picture. So, um, where did I put my Toy here. There you go. So let's see. Let's talk about. Let, let, let me stop. Let me stop because we're going to kind of switch gears a little bit. And I looked at the glance at the clock. We've got less than a half an hour left. Um, are there any questions about anything? I, you know, I, 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 I see if there are any questions, and then we'll spend a couple minutes there, and then then I'm going to ask you which topics you want to make sure we hit before we turn into pumpkins at eight o'clock. Yes. I'm sorry? Oh, that's a good question. That's a very good question. Her question, I'll repeat it because there's a lot of people here, is when do you find the, define the end of adolescence? If you were going to do it from a purely brain point of view, 25. Now, that's from a purely brain point of view. See? Yes. Yeah. Um, and for, you know, for those of you who, you know, who have kids who are a little bit older, you really start, you really do start to, to see some changes when the kids reach their mid-20s. And I'll, before we're finished tonight, I'll tell you about a couple of, in my own kids. Um, but that's the brain point, you know, that's from a brain point of view. And because this is all new information societally, you know, um, we don't really have a clear end of adolescence. Yes. I'm coming closer because I'm hard of hearing. So I hope I don't make you uncomfortable. Um, so we moved to Louisville. We're much younger. And it seems to us that adolescents here are very different from where we came from. Yep. So my question is how much do you think is really um, science, the brain, and how yep. much is culture influence? Yeah, great question. Uh, she shared with she shared with us. I'll repeat it because you probably didn't hear it. She shared with us that she's new to this country. Okay, new to the country, and her observation is teenagers in the country where she grew up are quite different from the teenagers here. And so her question was, how much of it is going on? What's going on in the brain, and how much of it is the culture? Both, because they interact. See, one of the things that our brains, all of our brains are remarkable at doing is adapting to the world in which we find ourselves, okay? Um, I, uh, I, this came, you know, I, I was, I'll, I'll give you one example. I could think of many, but I'll give you one example. Uh, my wife and I and my kids uh, about five years ago took a trip in the Amazon jungle in Peru. It was a wonderful experience. Scary experience because the guide said, don't touch anything, because everything is trying to eat you. But it was a wonderful experience. And then the other thing we were told is that stay with the group and stay in the campsite because you could go 20 paces and you could be completely lost, which was absolutely true. 
I mean, the, 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 the vegetation was so thick, it would be very easy to get lost very, very quickly. The guides themselves can actually, in the middle of the night, run through the jungle. Why? Because they're br they grew up in there. Their brains are completely adept, you know, adept at that, um, in, that, in that environment. So our brains adapt to the culture. So your question is, yes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and some of it has to do with, you know, the culture and what it promotes. You know, so certain cultures are much less tolerant of certain behaviors than others. And so, yeah. And, and, and by the way, it, it's not just humans. It's, um, it's other species. So they had, you may have, you may have read this because it received a lot of attention. But I think it was Tanzania uh, a number of years ago when poachers had killed a lot of the uh, older elephants. And so the parent elephants had been very tragically killed, which meant that what was left were a bunch of teenage elephants. And they started attacking all the villages and rampaging. So what did they do? They brought in adults to get them back in line. Okay, so it's not just humans. Oh, good, thanks. I wonder how anxiety plays into this. Okay, uh, anxiety, very, very good question. I wish we had till midnight. You don't, but I do. Um, one of the, you may have seen, I skipped through a couple slides early on, and that's what caught your eye. Um, anxiety can play into this in a couple of different ways. Uh, let me see if I can do this kind of in a short way. Um, one of the molecules of emotion that we have not mentioned yet, it's not even on a slide, is called GABA. Gamma amino butyric acid, G-A-B-A. -A. Uh, when our GABA levels are in a particular range, we feel calm and confident. When our GABA levels are low, we tend to be worried and fearful. Uh, research now shows that almost 20% of children are born with some deficit in GABA levels. Okay? In other words, about one out of five children is built, is literally born with what I would call a worried brain. Means that their radar is more finely tuned. A lot of times early on, uh, those children uh, in the preschool years, they're often, they're often described as shy. Uh, what they have in common is fear. Okay? Uh, and so the way they deal with the fear is to hold back. One of the temptations that we have for kids who have some anxiety is that we have, a, we have a temptation to, we sense it, and so we want to take care of them, which is not what they need. We need they need support, but not rescue, okay? Because what they have to do is they have to start to build their own resiliency muscles. Now, if I've been born with a brain that has a low GABA level, I don't know that, because this is the only brain I've ever had. Okay, so I don't know that other people are like that. Okay, so that's what I, you know, that, that's, that's, uh, th this is the brain that I've got. Now, I'm going to also hook another topic in here because it's related, and that is perfectionism. Okay, because some kids, see, pr a lot of times we think of perfectionists, for perfectionistic kids, as kids who are overachievers. They want to get everything right. That is one face of perfectionism. There is another face of perfectionism. The other face of perfectionism is to withdraw, to literally drop out. What's behind both of them is fear. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm talking about with anxiety. What's, about, what's behind that is fear. Um, and so for the, for, the, for the kid who kind of gets into the overachieving path to deal with anxiety or perfectionism. What they, that's, the kid who, uh, that's the kid who is sick, literally sick to his or her stomach the night before the big test, even though they always get the best grade. Okay, but their fear is so big. Now, the other face of it is the kid who drops out. 
Same thing is going on. It's fear, but they deal with it in very different ways. So that's the, qui that's the kid who quits the baseball team the day after the coach tells him how much talent he has. Okay? Why does he quit the baseball team? Because when the coach told him how much talent he has, what comes with that? Pressure to perform. See, that's the kid who knows the answer in class but never raises his hand. Why? Because if I raise my hand, what comes with that? Pressure to perform. And if I've got a worried brain, if I've got a brain with a lot of fear, that's too much. I'd rather, I'd, you know, I'd rather everybody think I don't know the answer. I know the answer, but I, I don't care. Now, by the way, if I take the withdrawal path, I have to have a reason for that in my own mind. So I come up with rationalizations. You know why I quit the baseball team, I tell my father? Because all those kids are a bunch of jerks. Those jocks are a bunch of jerks. What's really going on is I'm scared. But I have to have a reason. Why do I never raise my hand in class? Because those teachers are a bunch of losers. Okay? What's really going on is I'm scared. Okay? Um, this, by the way, I know firsthand because this is my son, Brian who literally quit the baseball team the day after the coach told him and who never put up his hand in class, okay? Um, and then, well, I'll tell you, then I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what happens. Kids who are anxious with that low GABA level, when they get to high school, if they end up at a party where alcohol is available and they take their first drink, guess what? Alcohol mimics GABA. And for those kids, they feel calm, relaxed, and confident for the first time in their life. Can you imagine how attractive that would be? About uh, eight years ago, I did a study with the Hazelden Treatment Center for teenagers, and we did a, uh, we did a screening for anxiety. 80% of the kids being treated for alcohol and drug abuse had an underlying anxiety disorder. What they were doing is medicating it. Okay? Uh, my son Brian, to complete the story, uh, that my son Brian, um, we kept pretty close tabs on him in high school, so he didn't get into big trouble in high school, but then, of course, he went off to college. And um, Brian is an alcoholic. And if he were here, he'd say, yes, I am. Now, the good news, he's been sober for over 10 years, uh, thanks to a police officer in Chicago. He went to school in Chicago, went to DePaul University. Uh, the, right after he graduated, he was driving the wrong way on a runway street. An Irish cop stopped him, saw his name was Walsh, and instead of arresting him for a DWI, punctured his tires and said, you better call somebody for a ride because you're not going to drive this car. That's how it happened. Okay. Then I'll, t then I'll finish the story. It'll only take a couple seconds. He called his brother Dan. And he, he was scared to death. And this is what happened. So Dan said, are you going to tell mom and dad? Me and, and Brian said, no. And Dan said, I'll give you until Saturday. If you don't, I will. So Brian called us, and I called his godfather, who is a recovering alcoholic, who got in the car drove eight hours to Chicago and took him to his first AA meeting. He's had, he had two slips in the year after that, and he's been sober since. Yeah, so, you know. Anyway, I, I, I'm sorry to get off on that. Any other questions? And then we're going to, I want a couple, a couple topics. I've been asked for sure by a couple people who came early to talk about technology. How, how important, how, uh, if you were going to, uh, how many, how many want to make sure that we cover that topic before we're done? Okay, good. We will. <laughs> we're going to go two more questions, and then we're going to talk about technology. Yes. Yep. So I have a question because you said teenagers. Here comes the microphone. Yes, I really enjoy your talk. Um, you said that teenagers need connection, love, and guidance. Yep. <clears throat> I find that my 16-year-old uh, is, you know, I, she, she was like, we did everything together and then she just disconnected. So there's no more connection as right. far as I'm concerned and it's like a huge loss for me. I feel yep. like I'm really grieving. 
and, and at the same time, she's like really angry, taking out all her anger on me, and is extremely disrespectful. So I'm just wondering if you, like, if, like in the past week, we, we haven't even talked. Like, I feel like disconnection is the only thing that's healthy because I have to teach her to be respectful to me, yep. and I need to have boundaries. Like, we need to have boundaries with these kids. So, yep. like, how do you have boundaries and connect? When they're when when this in, is in the a tricky part. It's they're this abusing like my daughter is actually abusing um, my love for her. Yeah, she's abusing yeah. it. It's a great question, so I'm glad that we did get to it because this is one of the big challenges, um, and this is th this is where the art comes in. First of all, we need to remember that teenagers need love. We also need to remember that loving a teenager can be a delayed gratification activity. If we are looking for the reward when they're 15 or 16, we may not get it. The reward comes when they become the kind of adults that we can be proud of and have a relationship with. Um, I was just talking about Brian, so I'll use that as an example, and I won't belabor this. But um, Brian, you probably have picked up that of our three kids, Brian is the one who really had us scared for a number of reasons. Okay, he pushed all the limits. And our communication uh, really, really suffered. Uh, seven years ago, he got married. And he, got he went to Peru to become fluent in Spanish. And while he was there, he met the woman of his dreams. And so uh, on Labor Day weekend, seven years ago, it'll be eight years this coming Labor Day, we went down to Cusco, Peru, which is where they lived. She, didn't, she couldn't enter the country at this point. They live here now, or they live in Minnesota with us, or not with us, but they live in Minnesota now, but she couldn't enter the country at that point, so they got married in Cusco, Peru. When we went down for the wedding, okay, in the room that they had reserved for me and Monica, there were already on each side of the bed on the table two big vases of flowers. And next to each vase was a letter. One addressed to me, Dad. One addressed to Monica, Mom. I, of course, threw open the one addressed to me. I tried to read it. Couldn't. The reason I couldn't is because I couldn't see it. The reason I couldn't see it is because my eyes were filled with tears. I never, ever thought that I would hear Brian say the things that he has said or write the things that he's written in recent years because when he was 15, I was the biggest jerk in the world. And so I, I say that because it's very, very important to hang in there at the same time not to become a doormat for disrespectful behavior. And so how to do both of those things. I think, we, I, I think what, here's what I would suggest. You sit down with your daughter and say, listen, okay? I don't treat you that way, and I will not tolerate being treated that way, okay? Uh, you don't have to like me right now. I can't make you like me, okay? But these are the ground rules. And it may be even helpful to write them out. And then in advance, you need to let her know what the consequences will be if she doesn't abide by the rules. See, sometimes when we get angry, we want to we get through to them. The most effective way is a strategy of limits and consequences. This is the way it looks. Okay? We let the kids know in advance what the expectation is or the limit. We also let them know what the consequence will be if they don't meet the expectation or if they don't abide by the limit. And then our job, if we need to, is to follow through on those consequences. It doesn't mean it will go smoothly. I can still remember the night Dan, um, Dan was uh, 17. He had to be 17 because he had his driver's license, and that was the issue. So he had gotten his driver's license, and he had permission to use the family car to go out on a Saturday night. Uh, his idea of a reasonable curfew and our idea of a reasonable curfew were not on the same page. And so in the days leading up to this, we'd have these discussions which then turn into arguments in which he would say, you know, your idea of a curfew was so stupid. No other kids have this curfew. So now it's, the, now it's Saturday night. He's getting ready to go out. He's got the keys in his hand. He says, what time do I have to be home? And so I said, Dan, we've talked about this. I, I can't remember what the exact time was. Let's say 11 o'clock. I said, Dan, we've talked about this. 11 o'clock is when you need to be home. He said, well, that's stupid. Nobody has to come home at 11 o'clock. All my friends are out after that. 
And I said, well, I'm sorry. That, that's, that's the curfew. And then he said, I'm not coming home at 11 o'clock. And I said, Dan, just remember, if you don't come home at 11 o'clock, you are choosing, and I, the word choose is very important, you are choosing to not use the car for the next three weeks. On his way out the door, the last thing he said was, I don't care, it's stupid, I'm not coming home. Between 7 p.m. and 11 p.m., I didn't know what time he was going to come home. Guess what time he came home? 11 o'clock. <laughs> because once he calmed down, he realized that the joy of staying out for another hour was not worth the, mystery, the misery of not being able to use the car for the week, three weeks. And, but here's the key. He had to know that I meant it. That's why consistency is so important. And this is hard. It's so hard. You know? Because this is, you know, this is where things get out of control and the kids, you know, and sometimes, you know, when they get big, we're afraid of their anger. You know, um, I've talked to parents who are literally scared of their kids. Yeah. And so we, you know, we need to, and if you need help, find somebody who can help you. Draw up these, you know, this, this is the contract. And maybe that's the only way you can relate right now is on contract. And in the book, I give you, you don't have to go to the book, but I mean, literally samples of contracts. We do need to, uh, to uh, touch on the technology because we've only got a couple minutes left. Okay. Um, this is exercise. Exercise is good for the brain. <laughs> okay. First of all, this is not an anti-technology session uh, section of this presentation. I love, uh, you saw my iPhone. I've got my iPad, I've got my, you know, the technology is great. And these are the tools of the 21st century. We want our kids to have them. But because our time is very limited, let's talk about a couple of the things that are really starting to emerge as worries, okay? Uh, first of all, let's remember the technology is neither good nor bad. It is very, very powerful. Okay, uh, and because it's powerful, it depends on how we use it. Now, why is it so powerful? Let's go back to the brain as we've done all night. Um, scientists discovered many years ago what are called the reward circuits of the brain. Okay, uh, you'll probably, this will probably make sense to you, the reward circuits of the brain are the circuits that produce dopamine. So the reward circuits of the brain produce dopamine. So I do something, I get a dopamine squirt, it feels really good. Then I wire a little, uh, a little circuit to my prefrontal cortex where I plan, so I figure out how I'm gonna repeat that wonderful experience that I just had. That's the reward circuits. We've known about them for literally 50 years. Here's the new discovery. Closely related to the reward circuits in the brain are what they are now calling the seeking circuits of the brain. We are hardwired to be seekers. Okay, it's a survival thing. We seek shelter, we seek food, we seek companionship. That's why friendships are so important. We seek, we seek information, that's what's behind curiosity. The difference between the reward circuits of the brain and the seeking circuits of the brain are, the reward circuits are I like, the seeking circuits are I want. All of this technology that is now all part of all of our lives is a natural match for the seeking circuits of the brain. Which is why it is so hard to ignore the ping or the buzz that tells me I have a message. That is why sometimes we go on the internet and it's like falling down a rabbit hole. <laughs> Literally, you go from one thing to another. I'll give you an example. Uh, a year, uh, year ago, December, I was invited to uh, present at a conference in Orlando, Disney World of all places. And it had been a busy week and I was gonna get in late and so I'm on my way, I'm on the shuttle from the airport to the hotel at Disney World. I'm thinking to myself, boy, I have to present tomorrow at 8 a.m., I better get a good night's sleep. So my plan was quick meal to my room, get a good night's sleep. I checked in, got a quick meal, went back to my room, I think to myself, maybe I'll check my email. <laughs> that wasn't the problem. Here was the problem. The problem was 
Two months earlier, my wife and I and some of our very close friends had gone on a trip to Greece. And in one of the towns that we visited in what's called the Mount Pelion area, the guy who, the person who was give, giving us the tour said, have any of you seen the movie Mamma Mia? And we've all seen the movie Mamma Mia. How many of you, by the way, have seen the movie Mamma Mia? Okay, this, then this story will make sense to all of you. And so he said, this is where they, fi they filmed the famous Mamma Mia dancing scene. And if you remember the movie, there's this wild dancing scene. Okay? So I said, oh, that's interesting. So now it's two months later. I'm getting ready to go to bed. I'm tired. And I think to myself, I wonder if there is a YouTube video of the Mamma Mia dancing scene <laughs> to see if I can identify that village. So I go to YouTube, and I put in, do this, you can do this yourself tonight, put in Mamma Mia dancing scene. There were 16 of them. And so I am seeing if I can recognize the village, and sure enough, it was that village. I'll be darned. Cool. And then, of course, Mamma Mia is based on the musical career of ABBA. And I think to myself, I wonder what ever happened to ABBA. <laughs> you know where this is going, right? An hour later, I know more about ABBA than any of you. It was like falling into a rabbit hole. And so that's part of the reason that this technology is so magnetic. And it's so magnetic, particularly for kids. And so the things that we have to watch out for is the misuse, I'm gonna, uh, is the misuse and the overuse. One of the misuse things is multitasking. Our brains are only built for one thing at a time. Now, kids will tell me, I've talked with teenagers about this, and they say, excuse me, Dr. Walsh, with all due respect, you can't multitask because you're really old. <laughs> we can do it because we've been doing it all their lives. Guess what? They can't do it any better than we, they can do it better than we can, but they still can't do it. Some of the best research, by the way, uh, has been done right here uh, in Palo Alto at Stanford, and you may know that we lost one of the best researchers in the world last, uh, about a year ago, Clifford Nass, who died of a heart attack, because he was doing some of the best research showing what the effect is of the overuse of, the overuse and multitasking by particularly young kids, by particularly adolescents. And I'm going to summarize it because of our time. Heavy technology users are now starting to show a deficit in real world communication skills. Remember where we started this conversation two hours ago? Whatever the brain does a lot of is what the brain gets good at. It turns out we are not automatically good at face to face communication. How do we get good at it? Practice. We get good at reading facial cues by practice. And one of the things that, that the, the late Clifford Nash discovered, and he did this, did this, a lot of his research with middle school girls, is that the really heavy technology users became less and less comfortable in face-to-face -face communication. So as they became less and less comfortable, what did they start to do? Resort more and more to, so it becomes kind of a vicious cycle. <laughs> So it's, it's, it's real world social skills, it's the multitasking. What happens is that kids who have, uh, who do a lot of multitasking, what they're actually doing is switching back and forth. We don't multitask, what we do is we switch back and forth. Okay, so what they get good at, whatever the brain does a lot of is what it gets good at. What they get very good at is switching back and forth. So um, it, it's not that they can't pay attention, is that they don't want to. They're so in the habit of the constant stimulation. The other issue, and I'll use the word which I hesitated to use for a number of years, is the word addiction. Um, and I hesitated to use the word until I went to the first international conference on video game and internet addiction hosted by the uh, Ministry of Education in Seoul, South Korea. And because I had done some writing about the United States, I was invited to this international conference. And I still remember the first day. So we were sitting around and I said, you know, we in the United States really hesitate to use the word addiction. And I still remember the psychiatrist, uh, the South Korean psychiatrist who looked at me and said, Dr. Walsh, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. 
Doug Gentile at Iowa State University has started to do some of the best research, and what he is finding is that almost 9% of video game players, young video game players in the United States, start to exhibit all of the behavioral symptoms that would be true of a cocaine addict or an alcoholic. They fight, they fight any limits, they, um, they, when they're not playing, they're thinking about playing, it literally starts to take over their lives. And, uh, you know, I think the, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, because I've written about this, maybe I get a, um, maybe I get a biased sample, I probably do, but I get many uh, online questions, and I'd say the topic that I hear most online, one is the disrespect topic that you talked about, and the other is, um, Video game and internet use is completely out of control. I've tried everything. Nothing is working. It's, you know, um, my kids are paying a really big price. What do I do? And um, I think this is emerging as something that, so if you, if you start to see, I think the first thing is to make sure that you've got the limits in place ahead of time. Once it's really out of control, it's hard to get it back in control. Um, and so making sure, you know, video games are great, and they are, um, but you have to keep it in balance with other things. And so negotiate what the, what the terms of use are, and then follow through on those. Um, if it does get out of control, then it may be at the point where you really need to start to take some, you know, uh, even get some professional help. Most communities now, have counselors and psychologists who are really starting to work with families to deal with the whole issue. So it, it can get out of control. So um, I said at the very beginning, I, I, I'm stopping. Okay. Um, I said at the very beginning that we could stay till midnight and not cover all the topics that, um, that you know, that would be fun to talk about. Um, but hopefully some of the ones that we did talk about tonight were you found helpful. Um, if you want to consider this an ongoing conversation, please fill out one of those cards or leave me a business card or however you want to do it. But let's remember that, um, I want to share, can I go five minutes? Is that okay? I want to I want to share something because this this might be a way to finish. I hope I can find it. Oh, maybe now I'm not going to be able to find it. Oh, yeah, here it is. This is true. Um, one of our family's most ambitious excursions was a two-week road trip to the mountains. I'm from Minneapolis, as you know. Monica and I were very excited that some, we both love the mountains and we're looking forward to sharing a wonderful experience with Dan, who was 15 at the time, Brian, 12, and Aaron, just turned 11. We packed on Friday night so we could start the next morning before the crack of dawn. Brian was hanging out with his friends in the neighborhood as we began to load the car. Our requests for help were completely ignored. As I pressed Brian to do his part, ignoring my request turned to hostile resistance. Why can't you load the car yourself? I don't even want to go on this stupid vacation, so why should I load the car? <laughs> Come on, Brian, I said in a forced, friendly, calm voice. After a lot of back and forth negotiations and threats, two trying to be happy parents and three sullen teenagers loaded the car. The next morning, we tried to get them going. At the next morning, as we tried to get them going, all three complained that we were leaving too early. Aaron suggested leaving about noon. <laughs> we explained once again that we wanted to reach the Black Hills by nightfall, and since it was at least a 10-hour drive from Minneapolis, we needed to get going. Aaron and Dan climbed into the car complaining about how ridiculous it was to leave before dawn. Brian continued with his theme of not wanting to go in the first place. Family vacations are so stupid was the last thing I heard him say as he settled into an hours-long stony cold silence. Given the alternative he was, he was offering, I was thankful that he gave us the silent treatment halfway through <laughs> South Dakota. When the sun did begin to make its way up above the horizon, I felt like it had already been a long day. 
Unbeknownst to me, it was just getting started. South Dakota allows the sale of fireworks. As soon as we crossed the border, Dan started in. When are we going to stop so I can buy some fireworks? Remember what I said, Dan? I answered, we haven't decided if we're going to buy fireworks. I only, dis I only said we'll check into it. What do you mean? I've got my own money. I'm getting fireworks. <laughs> we finally stopped at a small town for a break. Monica and I gave each other a look when we realized there was a large, large fireworks warehouse beside the gas station. <laughs> it was unavoidable. We had to at least have a look. When we stepped into the building, Dan's eyes lit up. He had never seen so many fireworks, and these were the big ones, the kind you can never find in Minnesota. As Dan ran off down the aisles in giddy amazement, I asked the guy selling them how all of this works in the eyes of the law. Well, it's 100% legal to buy all of these different classes of fireworks in South Dakota, but you can only set them off on private property. This law makes sense in South Dakota because there are lots of wide open spaces and large ranches. We Walshes, however, did not live in a wide open space and we did not own a ranch. By the time I caught up with Dan, he had his arms filled with monster fireworks. Not little bottle rockets and sparklers, but the kind you can see from the next county. <laughs> Dan, I'm sorry, but it's illegal to get those. What are you talking about? They're selling them. Yes, but you can only set them off on private property. Oh, come on, Dad. You can get some little ones and some bottle rockets, but you'll have to put the mortar shells and heavy artillery back. <laughs> Dan threw a fit, and I got an earful about how unfair this was, how we never let him do anything he really wanted to do. Then he explained how boring our family was and a horrible vacation this was going to be. <laughs> Somehow I got the rockets out of his arms and his body back in the car. We were once again on the road. The summer sun was beating down, but the atmosphere was decidedly chilly in the car. <laughs> Brian still wouldn't talk because he wanted to be home with his friends. Now Dan wouldn't talk because he was mad about fireworks. Two down, one to go. Within an hour, Aaron was complaining about the heat. We didn't have air conditioning, and the South Dakota prairie was hot. Soon, Aaron's complaints escalated to wailing about the heat and the fact that she hated this trip. Three for three. Monica and I looked at each other. One, one thought played repeatedly in my head like a broken record. I found out later she was thinking the same thing. Why were we doing this? Why were, we, why were we torturing ourselves? Why didn't we disown them, sell them, or drown them and hide the bodies? <laughs> then the two of us could go on a vacation that was fun. <laughs> this is true. One Christmas, years later, all three of our kids were home from their far-flung lives. One night at dinner, with the five of us sitting around the table, we started to reminisce about old times. The topic of vacations came up. We started to tell stories about different vacations. Eventually, Dan, Brian, and Aaron tried to decide which was the best vacation we'd taken. They all agreed that the best ever was that trip to the mountains. <laughs> the reason I wanted to finish with that is to leave with a message of hope. Hang in there. <laughs> Raising teenagers is not a problem to be solved. It's a mystery to be lived. And at the end of the adventure, we'll be able to answer the question, who done it? And of course, the answer is you and those kids together. And from there, to paraphrase Dr. Seuss, they'll have places to go and fun to be done. And thanks to your help, as parents who would come out on a Wednesday evening to talk about teenagers, the game can be won. Thank you. being here this evening. The, the parking lot is quite full, so as you make your way out, be careful. Uh, and um, I just want to say one other thing. Gigi, if you want to leave your name and uh, email information for Dr. Walls, Gigi's walking around and you can leave it on a post-it. And thank you so much again for being here on a Wednesday evening. We really appreciate it. And the books are up in the front. If you're interested, there's uh, several books here that Dr. Walsh can How is share with you. Similar to pre they're very closely same. related. Yeah, the kids, we should probably, I, I'll be happy to, to kind we'll of, talk about yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Effective. <laughs>